Lumpkin, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I've been wanting to talk to you um, for many years. I, uh, you're, mm. you are, you're one of my, the only triple threat authors that I, that I have, which is to say I have your book, uh, hardcover, Kindle, and audio. Um, and that was na um, Nature and the Human Soul, uh -huh. which, which is not a thin book, but I took it with me. Uh, a, uh, we went to South Africa for a year. And you can imagine you have to like pack very carefully. And yes, that, that, that and Derek Jensen um, um, were the only, uh, I think Endgame were the only books I brought with me and, and, uh -huh. and yours I brought home. Uh -huh. Yeah, those two books will keep you busy for a while. So, so um, you have a, a new book out, The Journey of Soul Initiation. And yes. there, are, there are so many things that I've been like thinking about talking to you about. And I guess the, the one that's up for me most is like, we've just gone through 2020, which has been a, a really interesting year. It's, mm. it's um, kind of, you know, shown a lot of fissures in our society and people have come up with all sorts of ways to deal with it. And what I get from your writing is that there's something very fundamental that is missing or not talked about or off or like, like we're looking at a very thin slice of reality and you invite us to look at a, a much bigger piece. And I'm wondering, yes. um, just like, can you just like introduce like what what are we missing? <laughs> it's a big question, but like what when you look at Western civilization, you grew up in it, you were groomed for success in it. Like what what are the areas of bandwidth, the ultraviolet and the infrared that we can't that we're not seeing? Yeah, it's interesting because it's basically ourselves we're not seeing. Um, probably everybody would agree if you've thought about it that um, all of the major crises on the planet now are caused by us, by our species, mm -hmm. by humans. And so it's not much of a leap to then ask ourselves, why, why are we doing that? Um, is there something fundamentally wrong with us? And by the way, I don't think there is. Um, but um, the conclusion I've ended up coming to is that the reason we're causing all this mess on the planet, basically destructing, destroying life, um, as it has been for many, many millions of years, um, is because of widespread arrested human development. And um, that is uh, the case, as far as I can tell, in all contemporary cultures that are industrialized. Um, what Rianne Eisler has called uh, dominator cultures, that we've um, essentially, to, to, to put a fine point on it, that um, relatively few people in contemporary cultures ever reach true adulthood. In fact, we don't even have a clear understanding of what true adulthood is. I mean, it's not even on the map. What we think of as adulthood is something that is neither particularly mature nor particularly exciting or alluring. <laughs> um, so, and that's a, a radical proposition to make. So I just wanna take a deep breath here with everybody and say, okay, consider the possibility that industrialized cultures have for hundreds of years, or if not thousands of years, um, decayed in a certain kind of way, psycho-spiritually, such that um, we've lost the perspectives and practices that support people to reach uh, true levels of maturity, true adulthood and, and true elderhood. So in part, I'm saying that it's common for people now to say that, you know, it, real elders are relatively rare, but I had to conclude um, with something even more radical that True adults are actually quite rare. I believe that maybe 10% of most of contemporary people in industrialized cultures reach true adulthood. And that might seem like a really radical idea, especially if you don't know yet what I mean by adulthood, which we'll probably get to. Um, 
but um, I'm just taking that in that idea. I mean, it's um, it's one way to, I, I think I've been able to help people get there is to say the way we're acting on this planet, the way too many of us are acting and treating life is not the way a mature human would approach life. That we've lost our sense of the sacred of the of the greater earth community as something that's sacred. And we've lost quite a bit more than that as well. Um, so to match the reality on the ground, which is an extraordinary crisis, I think everybody listening to us would agree with that. I mean, there's even wondering about whether our own species will be extinct sometime this century. And if not, whether the, how many of us humans will survive the cultural and economic and environmental collapses. So to match that radical premise that um, most contemporary humans don't never mature past actually what I consider early adolescence, to match that we'd say, well, look, we would need a conclusion that's that radical to be able to begin to understand how we became a life-destroying species when every other species we know of on this planet is not only life-sustaining, but life-enhancing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's a place to start, huh? Right, right. And it, it um, you know, I know one of, one of your most quoted uh, sources is the poet David White who heard th this line that's so piercing, right? That why something like we are the one uh, terrible part of creation privileged to refuse our flowering. Uh, and yes. you know, the, word, the word privilege is so stunning there. It is. Um, what, is that, what does that phrase mean to you? Because I think you've quoted it at least a couple of times in your books over the years. Yeah, yeah, David White wondering why we are that, the, but, one, how does he say it? The one element or the one corner of creation privilege to refuse its own flowering. Yeah. Um, so the flowering, of course, is what he, I believe he's referring to the same sort of thing I am when I say true adulthood, which one of my phrases for that is a visionary artisan of cultural renaissance. That's, that's a, a nice short phase, not phrase, not quite a a um, definition yet of adulthood. But then as you point out, um, David says we're privileged to refuse our own flowering. And so to me, that implies that um, there's a certain kind of power we have, a certain kind of capacity we have that is, maybe uniquely human or de definitely for sure definitive of being human that is the a power that would enable us to take our true place in on earth or even more generally in the cosmos but that power can also be used to um what what we say place ourselves in a certain kind of trance and create something like the matrix, you know, that we're, we're stuck in um, this incapacity to see what the world really is and what our place is. And so if it's, if it's one of our unique human powers that enables us to not flower, um, then that same power en enables us to, to grow into our true magnificence and, and that power, I believe, has to, and many others would say the same, has to do with our mode of consciousness, our um, what sometimes is called our capacity for conscious self-reflection or conscious self-awareness, which is to say we have egos, by which I don't mean something that's bad, but something that makes us, in fact, human. Without egos, we wouldn't be human. And by ego, I simply mean the capacity to be aware of ourselves, to know that we know. Um, and this is a, a power that requires us to be raised by our parents and communities in a careful way so that we learn how to use that power in a good way. And that's what we've lost. We've, 
We've lost most of the elders, most of the true adults, and most of the initiatory practices, and uh, just the healthy ways of raising children, such that um, we, we end up being what can be simply called egocentric, which means to think we're, it, our, who we are is all about our ego, as opposed to our ego is a unique power that we have to serve the world or to serve mystery or to serve our souls. Um, so yeah, it's, um, that's what we've lost, I believe. Uh, the, the approach to child rearing and beyond the initiatory rights into true adulthood that would allow us to use our egos in, way that, in ways that serve life. Right. Before I encountered your work, I, um, I thought that everything that was wrong with me was like individual pathology. Mm -hmm. right? That everything yeah. was wrong with anyone. It's like, well, you know, we have shrinks for that. We have counselors, we have therapists, we have um, self-help books, we have movements. And that there was, you know, something happened to me in the same way that if I have a garden and most of the plants are flowering, but over in this bed, they aren't. It's because mm -hmm. there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. When I read your work, it was, it was that the, the, the individual doesn't and can't exist outside of, of a broader whole. And when you're talking about that broader whole, you're not just talking about our society. And, and other other humans, which, which like for me was the first like big revelatory breakthrough that that somehow I can't be whole except in relation to what you call mystery and which is embodied by like the, the greater than human or more than human world. And can, can you talk about like that relationship, which I think you define as a soul? Ultimately? Yeah, um, a lot of good points there. Um, the first one is that um, it's not really our individual fault that in, in, in contemporary cultures that we have trouble maturing. It's because they, um, again, as I've been saying, the culture, uh, contemporary societies have lost our, our resources for supporting people to do that. But your larger um, point there, I think is a really important one that um, to, to be healthy humans, we need to have healthy reciprocal relationships with the, the larger world. Um, and um, in particular, it's our relationship with soul that enables us to reach true adulthood. Um, so now we got to take a pause here and say, well, what, what do we mean by soul? In particular, what do I mean? Because when I, my definition of soul, which um, took me a number of decades to get to, um, is quite radically different than almost any other definition you've ever heard. And at first you might think I'm changing the subject, but I'm, I hope to convince you that I'm, I'm not. Um, I think that the reason we've had such a difficulty understanding soul and also maturing is because we don't really understand what soul is. So I'm, I'm a psychologist, or at least was. I'm, sometimes I say I'm a recovering psychologist or a psychologist that, who's gone wild. Um, and so, and in particular, one of my um, f uh, frameworks is depth psychology. So like most psychologists and maybe most people in contemporary cultures, we tend to think of soul as a psychological concept. That's something inside of us. Uh, or in a religious way, we might think of it as something, you know, a, a semi-material thing that, um, that leaves our body when we die and so forth. Um, so soul is often a religious concept like that, or it's a psychological one and very commonly a spiritual one. Um, but what, occurred to me after years of trying to use soul the way contemporary Western culture uses it is to realize that soul is primarily an ecological concept. Um, and my definition is very simple. Um, a soul of a thing is its unique place in the, its ecological system, its unique ecological niche, the particular place 
or, or function, if you will, um, or really the best word is niche, that we were born to take uh, in the larger earth community. And everything is born to take a particular place. And as far as we know, we might be the only species that has to go through some kind of initiatory process in order to discover and embody that unique place we were born to take. So, okay, let's take a pause again and consider this. It's a very radical idea for a lot of people that we're each born, each human is born to take a particular place in the greater earth community, not simply in our human community, but in the greater earth community. And the, the place we take in our, end up taking once we're initiated in our human community, which is to say a social role or a vocation or a job or an art or discipline, um, that is the way of embodying and, or expressing the particular place uh, or niche in the earth community we were born to take. Um, so we know this is true about other species. We know they're born like most species other than mammals and birds don't even have parents past conception and birth. And most species are left on their own to figure out if you will, or to find and embody their true place in the world. They're born with that knowledge of who they are and what to do. Mm. And their understanding, um, if they have one, it's not a conscious one, not the way we do, but their awareness of their place is of course an ecological one. So isn't it odd if you come to think of it that we humans wouldn't experience ourselves that way, that we were born with um, to take a certain, uh, embody a certain ecological niche. Um, the difference is again, that we um, to be fully human need to go through this phase called childhood in which we learn how to um, have and use a human ego, uh, uh, a power of consciousness in which we're aware of ourselves. And then adolescence is meant to be a stage in which we create our own version of, a, of an ego, if you will, or a um, social presence with a somewhat different value system than our parents. So that, because in a certain sense, you know, the ego that we have in childhood is largely a function of um, our linguistic community and our family and, and our um, immediate human community. Um, and so in early adolescence, the psychological stage of early adolescence, which starts at puberty, but I believe in the vast majority of contemporary humans, we never get out of early adolescence, we get stuck there. And we can talk later if you'd like about why. Um, but in that stage of early adolescence, then we consciously create our own personal social presence and with our inside of our peer group. Um, and um, let's see, so, okay, soul is what I'm trying to explain here. That ecological concept of soul as a unique ecological niche, we first have to create uh, an ego that understands itself in um, social terms, basically. And then once we've done that successfully, then mystery kind of tosses us into the next stage of life, which I call the late adolescence or uh, the cocoon. Again, it's the stage that probably at least 80% of contemporary people in industrialized cultures never reach. But in the cocoon, then that during that initiatory process, which is a process of several years, it's not merely a rite of passage at all. It's a long initiatory process. During that, um, the goal of that process is to discover that knowledge we were born with. Some cultures call it our original instructions. David White, the poet you mentioned earlier, has a wonderful phrase for it. He says, the truth at the center of the image we were born with. Imagine that, that we were born with an image and that there's a truth at its center. And that truth is um, the one which we are meant to live and embody in our life. And we can't discover it at all until 
we've successfully gone through early adolescence, which is again, so hard for contemporary people to get through. But once we get through that, then we go through this initiatory process that I call the journey of soul initiation. Um, and that's of course the title of my new book. And that journey of soul initiation is I believe one that every healthy, which is say nature-based culture has always had some kind of version of and that we need to um, create our own contemporary Western version of, and any healthy future culture will have a version of. So I'll just as one last point here, it's always important to me to point out that um, the approach that we've taken at Animus Valley Institute, and we've been developing now for 40 years, is contemporary nature-based and Western. It is not based on any indigenous traditions it's not a ripoff, it's not an appropriation, it's not, not a co-optation of any other tradition. It's mostly based on Western mysticism actually, and also in our um, natural human capacity to be in deep relationship with the more than human world. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and, it's, and so like, as I started you know, reading the book, you, you kept on in anticipating my misunderstandings. So at mm -hmm. first, Oh, so this is about some sort of initiation. And then I realized that while well, getting initiated, the things that I've done, like weekend workshops and um, rites of passage was like going, you know, going to graduation without ever, ever having attended classes. That mm -hmm. yeah. those, are, those become symbolic of nothing if you haven't done the work. I also have mapped myself onto sort of your, you know, your wheel of, of human development. And yeah. I've got to say, like, it's, it's not fun for me to realize that I'm kind of stuck in, in, in that early adolescence. Um, right, like when you say like, okay, so I don't, I don't really know my place. I don't have like, uh, mm -hmm. when, we started talking about, you know, you're, you have, you have talk about yourself as sort of, uh, you create cocoons for people to undergo that. Um, like I've always thought of it, like my, like when I find my place, I'll figure out my job or my career and like, oh, now I'm in the health field and, and in sort of planetary ecology and environmentalism. So that's my, that's my role. And you're asking me to go far more fundamental, far deeper into understanding who I am than just, okay, this is like a good career thing for me. Yes. And, and so one of the, you know, one of my wonderings is if, if we live in a society in which there are almost no true adults, how do, you know, who can give us a leg up? How can, how can, how can I, you know, go on this journey um, when there, there is no map and, you know, like I'm in my late fifties and this is going to take five or six years maybe. And like, I, you know, like, what do we, what do we do about it? When we, when we read, you know, read your work and discover, oh, you know, I thought I was developing and I realized I've really been stunted and I, and I want the thing, but I don't know how to go about it. And I don't know if I really want it. Like part of me is, is a little bit in, in denial and fear, like I'm, you know, I'll be, all, I'm all right with living with my my existential dread as part of a a species that's destroying the planet. Like part of me is okay with that. You know what I mean? Um, boy, you said a lot there. Um, let's see if I can get through that. I mean, really important points and questions. Um, so yeah, first you mentioned initiation. And um, there's all kinds of initiations in life. I mean, there's a whole series, um, especially if we get through early adolescence, but even up to then there are various initiations. Birth is a kind of initiation. Mm. And there's two whole categories of initiations. One has to do with um, profound changes in our um, consciousness, or as I say, our center of gravity, um, where our identity changes in a very fundamental way. Uh, psycho-spiritual way um, and um, and a second kind are more like social status changes like getting married or um, being inducted into a group or a priesthood or something like that uh, or men's group or um, and those more social initiations 
Um, one thing that's true about that is generally there's an initiator or a group that that you get into the new status. You acquire the new status because somebody or some group has said that you're a member, that we now embrace you as one of us. And so it's um, with those initiations, a rite of passage changes your social status or your religious status or whatever it is, or your vocational status, you know, in the sorority and when you weren't before and so on. Um, but with the, the more profound initiations, the um, ones that involve psycho-spiritual transformation, like uh, changing, moving from one stage of life to the next, there is no human who um, bestows upon you the, the new status. It's not possible to do that. Um, it's mystery that provides you with the, the new status. And, and those initiations of rite of passage um, doesn't change your, your um, doesn't make the change in you. It doesn't, you don't become an adult because somebody says you now are an adult. Um, and um, what a rite of passage does in that case is it celebrates and formally marks a passage that you've already achieved or that mystery has bestowed upon you. And that those are really important, those rites of passage, even though they don't make the change itself. What they do is they let you know what has happened to you. They help you understand what has already happened to you. And they let your community know that this has happened to you. And they help you orient to this new stage of life, which is gonna be really uh, unfamiliar, obviously, at first, and you're going to have trouble with it, and you're going to need some help. Can you give an example, maybe from you know from your own life and your own story about you've talked about your some of your initiations, or yeah, you know, I think I, yeah, I'd love for I think it would help me and listeners to kind of ground it in a, a story. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so my first soul encounter. Um, let me define that. A soul encounter is a glimpse of our unique ecological niche. But it's not a literal kind of ecological experience. Um, the way it works for us humans is that when we discover our unique ecological niche, what we're, the experience we're actually having is um, of a metaphor that the, uh, through a dream or a waking experience, um, or a deep insight, we become aware of the pattern that we make with our life that we hadn't been aware of before. And this pattern has to do with our unique ecological niche, but it, it comes through a metaphor or a symbol. Um, and so we call that mythopoetic identity, that we, we have an experience that points to our unique ecological niche by showing us a symbol or an image or a metaphor or a dance um, or an, yeah, an image of some sort that um, is our conscious way of understanding our unique ecological niche. So for me, my first soul encounter was when I was 30 and it happened on the fourth day of my first vision fast. And by the way, one doesn't have to do a vision fast in order to have a soul encounter. Um, it's not necessarily even the best way, but it's not an uncommon way. Um, so during that um, first vision fast when I was 30, which I was alone in, in the mountains high in Colorado at the tree line, 11,500 feet approximately. And um, during that fourth day, I was um, in conversation with a spruce tree, which to me had become a monk, a Zen monk actually. Um, and he was teaching me wordlessly about his relationship to the lake that he was on the shore of. And after four days of fasting and alone and uh, enacting a variety of ceremonies, this is not an unusual kind of thing at all. Our consciousness does shift to be in a very deep, resonance uh, and um, com uh, companionship really with the beings of the more than human world. So after a while, the spruce tree who was in conversation with the beavers of that lake um, turned to me and made a gesture to me. That's the way it seemed to me. 
and pointed to its left, my left as well, um, because it had its back to me. And um, I looked to the left and I saw a large yellow butterfly um, flying and the butterfly flew in my direction and came right to me in that indirect way that butterflies fly and actually brushed the left side of my face with its wing as it went by. And I heard the words in English, cocoon weaver. Again, wasn't that particularly surprising after um, four days of fasting and in ceremony. Um, and at first it wasn't to me any more interesting than the community of pikas, these little uh, mammals that live at high altitude in, in the Rockies, um, who were, this was in early, late August, which is early fall. And so they were really, the pikas were really, really busy gathering watercress by the um, edge of a little stream I was on the side of um, to store up for winter. And, and I felt like um, these, these are really highly developed gatherers. And I hoped to myself one day be, become a gatherer, at least in a spiritual sense, like they were. Um, but maybe about a minute after the butterfly went by, there was this enormously powerful emotion that came up from my belly through my throat as kind of um, a cry. And I realized that I had um, just been shown something uh, through this image or this notion of weaving cocoons, which um, was who I was and who I was born to be and what I was to do in my life, even though I did not have the foggiest idea what that could possibly mean. But something in me recognized that's, that's who I am. Um, and um, so I, I did, I cried for a while and, um, and then I started writing a bit in my journal and I knew that this was what I would dedicate myself to even though, as I say, I didn't know what it meant. <clears throat> so cocoon weaving was the first glimpse I had received of my mythopoetic identity, which points to my unique ecological niche. Mm. So I hope that is an example that works. And I'll just say in the book, there's at least a dozen examples, a few from famous people like Carl Jung, Joanna Macy, William Butler Yeats, Robert Johnson, the depth psychologist, um, and many examples from people I've had the um, pleasure and honor of guiding over the years. Right. So one, one of those people, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the exact details, but had one of these experiences and immediately had a voice on her shoulder saying, well, that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> And like when I'm reading your story, there's part part of me that feels jealous and part of me feels very entitled. Like I should be able, like there seems like to me, like for me, there's a catch 22. Like when you talk mm. about, I was having a conversation with a spruce tree, part of me goes, well, I would feel so silly. Yeah. And like, well, but if, but if I were fasting for four days at, at altitude, maybe I wouldn't feel silly. And I think, well, then, you know, it must be a hallucination. Mm -hmm. Like the, you know, the part of the rational part of my mind. Um, yeah wants, you know, part of me really wants this. And part of me is incredibly resistant. Um, yes. The catch 22 is like, I have to put myself in the place where I can have that experience. And yet, until I'm able to do that, I'm not going to put myself in that place. So how, how does someone, some, you know, someone stuck in early adolescence where, you know, image like, and, and literally, like I go out into the backwoods, and I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to talk to this tree. And energetically, I'm looking around to see if anyone is watching me. Sure. Like I'm, I'm curating <laughs> my image, even in empty woods. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we do. Um, that's what a person does um, in early adolescence. And in some ways afterwards, I mean, um, we were, were still social and psychological creatures afterwards. Uh, before we've gone on the journey of soul initiation, and in particular, the, the specific spiritual adventure I call the descent to soul, which by the way, this book is primarily about the descent to soul, which is something that takes anywhere from a week to years. It's very rare that it's as short as a week. Um, and it's, as I say, the primary spiritual adventure in this larger 
journey that we call the journey of soul initiation, which is an entire stage of life, namely the one I call a late adolescence, who's my um, more colorful name for late adolescence is the cocoon, not surprisingly. So um, before we, we go on our first descent, and certainly before we've started the journey of soul initiation, which is to say before we've entered the cocoon, um, we have these inner protectors in our psyche that are, will do everything they can to keep us from going on this journey because they know it'll, it'll change everything. That everything we thought we were and what life was and what the world is and what we wanted to accomplish in life, it's all going to be um, um, tossed off the, the table. Um, and our inner protectors, which I also call our subpersonalities, um, they know that, and they're going to they're going to help us um, stay safe and stay safe, stay in our familiar identity um, by creating all kinds of resistance, like eh, I wouldn't want to do that anyways, or I'm not. It may be I want to do that, but want to have that experience, but I'm not really eligible, I'm not really ready for it, or I don't have any guides and I wouldn't know how to do it, I make a mess of it and so on. This, and this is just being normal human actually in some ways, especially in our kind of culture. Our inner protector's job is to keep us safe and to keep us from changing too much. Um, and so that's one of the things to, to answer your question about if a person understands that they're in the psychological stage of early adolescence <clears throat> that starts at puberty and may or may not ever end, no matter how long we live. Um, if we're in early adolescence, then one of the things we need to do is to befriend our inner protectors, not get rid of them because you can't, <clears throat> not fight them because it's a losing battle, but begin to appreciate and love these inner protectors who might say to us that we're not worthy um, and so on and realize how they're trying to help us and thank them for doing such a good job at keeping us safe, even though they're also keeping us miserable and keeping us from growing. They're also doing a good job. But more generally, the um, um, in my nature-based map of the stages of human development, which I call the soul-centric developmental wheel, which is the subject of my earlier book, Nature and the Human Soul. That's a big orange book. Sometimes we call it Bob for big orange book. Oh. <laughs> um, in Bob, um, there's this uh, description of these eight stages that I believe nature means for us humans to go through. And there's two stages of childhood, two of adolescence, two of adulthood, two of elderhood. But early each stage has two developmental tasks. And the what we humans can do to support ourselves and others to um, grow psychologically and spiritually is to address the, the stage that we're in. And um, like all stages, early adolescence has two tasks. And its two tasks are to um, uh, cultivate our personal authenticity. And the second task is to um, embody ourselves, our, to create a social presence that is socially acceptable to, to our, at least our peer group. Hmm. So authenticity and acceptance, those are the two tasks of early adolescence. And uh, acceptance is relatively easy um, in our culture, but Authenticity, personal authenticity is really challenging because two kinds of reasons. One is our culture puts such an emphasis on conformity. In fact, I call our culture a um, conformist consumer culture. And there's such an emphasis on fitting in that um, we've lost our capacity to really discover who we actually are, even on a social, personal personality level. But our, our culture doesn't, it's not obvious that to people that it's a conformist culture, right? I mean, we're supposed to be individuals, we're supposed to have our own expression and tastes and, and views. And, um, you know, we're not like, 
um, you know, communist China where there's one like, we're, you know, it's like I, on the Internet, I can find thousands of interest groups that are highly niched. How 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 does that hide conformity? Yeah, really good question, Howie. <clears throat> Um, it's the difference between individualism and individuation, but let me be more specific. Um, I think everybody knows it's a conformist society in that, you know, the, the advertising campaigns all try to get us to be like everybody else in some way, or at least everybody else in a particular social niche or circle, that we've got to get um, the new gadget, the new device, the new style, um, fashion, clothing, fashion, and so on, in order to fit in. Um, but it's also, of course, yeah, there's a very strong emphasis in our contemporary culture, our Western culture, on our individual style. And But it's a style that we pick consciously, that we choose it in order to have a certain effect, that we want to have, um, what's it called? Uh, we want to make a certain kind of social impression and so we choose a style that we think will get us the kinds of things we want to get, which have to do with social acceptance and or, you know, stuff, um, possessions. Um, so that's consciously done. But true authenticity has to do with discovering who we actually are, not cr consciously creating a style. That conscious style creation is individualism. But individuation, which is a term from Carl Jung, is discovering who we actually are. But in early adolescence, it's not particularly deep or mystical. It's simply, what are my true values? Not what are the values that I can um, that I can enact in some, I can impersonate, <laughs> so that I will have a certain get a, create a certain social effect that I'd like to have. But what, what are my actual true values? And what are the things I'm really interested in? Um, especially those things that might not fit in in my social group. And what's, what's the style that um, is rooted in who I actually am and my, my natural abilities and capacities and, and so forth? But what are the things that, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that seems like it would be a heck of a lot easier in an indigenous culture where, okay, I, I have these values that are slightly different or slightly at odds or are gonna, but in this culture to like, I'm, you know, my kids are, um, you know, in their uh, early mid twenties and I've seen them struggle with individuation and various times like needing to fit in and at other times really not. And it's always been a choice. It's never, it's never seemed like within this culture, there is a, a way in which they can enact both tasks at the same time. It's always going to be a choice because the culture is so toxic to, to their real development. It is. It's true. It is toxic to our real development. Um, so the trouble actually starts before early adolescence. It starts in early childhood and middle childhood. Um, there are a certain capacities that in a healthy culture we would develop in childhood that we, a lot of us have trouble developing. And so we get to early adolescence with, uh, with already some um, developmental deficits, which makes it hard to discover our actual authenticity. So a couple examples for you. Um, in early childhood, we don't have any task ourselves directly because we don't have the kind of consciousness or um, you know, personal development where we can even relate to what a task could possibly be. Early adolescence being the first three or four years, I'm sorry, early childhood for our first three or four years. And so it's the family and the, or the extended family that has the tasks on behalf of a newborn for the, and for the first three or four years. And one of the tasks of early childhood is, um, is the uh, preservation of innocence because we're born innocent. And um, innocence is very close to, not quite the same as, but in order to try to make a point here a little quicker, um, in, our innate innocence is very much related to our capacity for present centeredness, to just be here and not try to get somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in the contemporary world, even in early childhood, our um, capacity for presence is undermined by this sense that parents might have, I got to get my child to have a head start and um, be able to learn. It's important to learn language really quickly and to get toilet trained and uh, learn how to use screens and and so forth because the parents who aren't are likely not initiated themselves and probably in early adolescence they put their value system on their children naturally and so a child's capacity for present centeredness is often undermined by the time they reach middle childhood around age four well present centeredness turns out to be the foundation the foundation capacity for relationality and empathy. We can't really be fully with another person unless we can be present with them. And if we have a hard time being present with anything, which by the way, uh, contemporary uh, computer devices, phones and so forth, undermine our capacity, capacity to be present. And it, it results in most everybody with attention deficit disorder, which is to say not able to be present. Um, and so we're not able to be, once we hit early or arrive in early adolescence, we have trouble being um, emotionally present or even at attentionally present with other humans, including ourselves. Um, and so we, we have trouble knowing um, who we are, developing our authenticity. And another example is from middle childhood, the um, one of the two tasks, it's the, what I call the nature oriented task of, of middle childhood is to learn the enchantment of the more than human world, is to discover ourselves as a member of this larger world and to find ourselves at home in this world. And this world of many other species and habitats and mountains and clouds and rivers and so on. And if we don't do that, if we're kept from doing that, which is what our contemporary cultures do, where you know you might think of Richard Liu's book here, The Last Child in the Woods. If we have what he calls nature deficit disorder, which most contemporary people have, we by the time we get to early adolescence, there's a certain kind of anxiety and restlessness and homelessness at the very core of our psyches. And we don't know why. And we think it's because maybe we don't we're not, we're not as fully accepted in our peer group as we want, but, and that may or may not be true, but deeper than that, we don't feel at home on earth. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of, this deep sense of I don't belong. And our conscious ego mind says to ourselves, oh, I don't, I'm not as fully accepted by my peer group as I ought to be. And again, that may or may not be true, but the deeper problem is that I'm not at home in this, earth community of many species and habitats. And, and so all those things make it hard. So to answer your question, what do you suge suggest for um, your young adult, that's adult in quotes, um, children or other people you know or yourself and so forth? If you're in early adolescence, if you believe that's true and you're stuck, um, you actually, one of the most helpful things is to address your unfinished business from childhood, um, which one is the capacity for present centeredness. There's more, but I'm just giving you a brief um, uh, outline here. And one way to address the difficulty with present centeredness is a meditation discipline or a contemplative discipline. Um, that's really helpful for all kinds of reasons. They're not necessarily even spiritual, just to train our attention to be present and to open our hearts and um, be, be able to be heartfully present with other people and ourselves. And then um, another thing that's so important for early adolescents who feel like they're stuck there, and again, I don't mean teenagers, I mean people stuck in the psychological stage of early adolescence, is to um, befriend the natural world. Well, that's also something that's becoming more and more popular, just like meditation disciplines are, that very commonly, these are called um, nature connection um, workshops or experiences or retreats, which help us um, eventually have this experience that I call eco-awakening. 
in which we have the, a somatic, not a cognitive, but a somatic experience in our bodies of being related kinship wise to every other um, life form on the planet. And we experience ourselves as a human animal, that's a good thing, and as being as wild and natural as anything else on the planet. So my shorthand answer to you, Howie, here is that um, if we feel um, we are stuck in early adolescence, which is a great stage to be in, just not great to be stuck there, um, or if there's others we're working with who we feel are in early adolescence, the best things to do are to um, address the unfinished business from childhood and also then um, address this task of, of becoming authentic in a social and in, intrapersonal way. Gotcha. So what, one of the things that was you know, challenging me is I think like, the, you know, this book really was an invitation for me to like, go do like, do this work. Like, what are you waiting for? Like, you know? <laughs> and so like, what about, like, I have a lot of freedom in my life in that, you know, I write and teach and I could kind of like go anywhere, but what if somebody who like their job is like an accountant or a lawyer or somewhere where they're really ensconced in this culture? And if they come up with their mythopoetic identity, like it could be totally at odds with survival, even like just making a living, paying the rent, putting food on the table. How, how do we navigate the task that you have identified for us to individuate and embody and, rep and, and discover and enact our souls? Like, is this the most, is this like, we have to do it together. Like Jeff Bezos has to do this too, so that he can change Amazon. So the people who work there can, can do it. Like how, how do we move forward in the sort of balancing the individual and the political? Mm, really good question. Uh, the first thing to say and to emphasize is that most people in contemporary societies aren't eligible for the journey of soul initiation. They're not psycho-spiritually eligible. They're not in what I call late adolescence or the cocoon yet. And so if someone like reads my new book and they're in early adolescence and they try to be in the cocoon and they pretend to be, they, it won't work. And they'll actually make it harder to ever get there because they won't be addressing the task of the stage they're actually in. So, and this is something that we, basically don't find in Western psychology, um, which is why I, I basically started over with my own uh, developmental psychology, that this idea that you can be in an adult body, but not yet in an adult stage or even a late adolescent stage, and therefore not eligible for certain kinds of spiritual and psychological development. That's, that's not the idea that we have. Most everybody has about ourselves. We say, okay, I'm an adult, I'm 18 or 21 or whatever. And um, here's a new spiritual approach, one I wasn't familiar with before or a new psychological development approach that's unfamiliar to me. So I ought to be able to just dive right in. This thing about mythopoetic identity, hmm, sounds pretty interesting. I'll get started tomorrow, right, I'll but you I'll can't. I'll, I'll take three tabs of LSD and find it. Well, three tabs of LSD might actually help or it might actually um, kill you, but <laughs> you might kill yourself on it. Um, but um, I'll just put here as a footnote because that of interesting point you made that in my generation and maybe some generations since, basically boomer generation or as we called ourselves then hippies, many of us, um, what helped us get from early adolescence to late adolescence, the percentage of us still a minority that got to late adolescence, the cocoon, it was entheogens or psychedelics. That, that the psychedelics so changed and undermined our sense of what reality is that um, it helped us complete the tasks of early adolescence, not complete them, but address them enough that mystery tossed us into the cocoon. Mm. Um, so that's the my first, point I want to emphasize um, in response to your question, Howie, that not just anybody, Jeff Bezos can't 
say, okay, I'm going to discover my mythopoetic identity, um, unless he's in the cocoon. I have no idea what stage he might be in. I know virtually nothing about him, but one might uh, guess that he wouldn't be doing what he was doing if he was in the cocoon um, or later. Um, so that's the first thing is that is to be in the stage you're in. That there's one of the principles we work with is you'll never leave the stage you're in until you love it, mm. until you're having a great time. And when people are loving early adolescence, they are creating a social presence and a vocational um, reality that is fulfilling for them and that they love. And that people who get tossed into the cocoon by the mystery are people who are successful socially and vocationally, not the people whose lives are complete wreck. Once you get in the cocoon, your life will be wrecked in a different kind of way, but you won't get into it, the cocoon, until you have acquired a certain kind of social uh, success and vocational success. Wasn't there a poem that you had in Nature and the Human Soul, basically, that you put your, like you finally finished building your house and you put the picture on the mantle and then the door swings open and you have to leave? Like the moment you can yeah. enjoy you built i can't remember what it's a dh lawrence poem um whose title i may or may not be able to remember oh, but yeah that. that's the idea from the poem um he says there's three strange angels that come knocking on your door mm. uh and um they basically say to us this is what happens at the end of early adolescence um, when we're about to move into the cocoon. And that life passage I call confirmation because what's being confirmed is that you have now created a social presence that's socially acceptable in your peer group and it's authentic, it's real. It's a real version of you. Mm. Great job. You're gonna need to know how to do that later again in life when you create a new, yet another new social presence in early adulthood that is not accepted. It doesn't matter whether it's accepted by your peer group, it's matter it matters whether or not it's an effective vehicle for you to embody your soul's passions, which you're going to learn about in late adolescence. Um, so the image there from D.H. Lawrence is that the three strange angels come to your door and he says in the poem, admit them, admit them, let them in. And um, you let them in and they'll size you up and make sure you're really ready to the, the journey of soul initiation. And then they'll, escort you out of your house and maybe they'll say you might want to turn around and say goodbye because you're never coming back mm -hmm. and that's essentially what the elders the elders are these three strange um, individuals who come to our door um, and the elders in a healthy culture the elders are watching all the youth to see signs that they might be getting complete with early adolescence which i call the oasis and that the elders are going to take them out of the oasis and bring them into the initiatory experience. And um, once we do for contemporary people who are in the cocoon, there is this question that you mentioned, which is, okay, how am I going to make a living? Um, if You don't necessarily have to quit your job when you're in the cocoon, but many people do, um, especially if you realize you're working for a company who's basically helping to kill life on our planet, you'd probably wanna leave your job, but you might wanna leave um, anyways, if you can, but some people can't. And some people who enter the cocoon even have children who are dependent on them, mm -hmm. which makes the cocoon a lot more challenging, but still possible. So we, there's two dances we talk about at Animus. We call them the survival dance and the sacred dance. And the survival dance is whatever we do to, as we say, make a living. And for most people, that's a job, but for other people, it's being in a certain kind of relationship to another person or a certain kind of relationship to the land where we're um, living directly in relationship to the land and we're not paid any money. But in any case, everybody has to have a survival dance. Once we're in the cocoon, um, our goal is to discover what our sacred dance is, what we were born to do in this lifetime. And it won't be defined in terms of a job. It can't be. It won't be defined in terms of a social role. It'll be defined by a mythopoetic image. Like in my case, it was weaving cocoons. 
Um, and then once we go through the passage at the end of the journey of soul initiation, that passage we call soul initiation, um, and enter early adulthood, which we call the apprentice, the soul apprentice at the wellspring, then one of our first tasks in early adulthood is to discover what we call a delivery system for embodying our mythopoetic identity, which is a way of understanding our unique ecological niche. And if we didn't know better, we might think a delivery system is like a job or a career, and often it looks that way, but that job or career, that social role is no longer a life purpose. It's just, it's a way of delivering our true life purpose, which is our mythopoetic identity. So, and what happens in a successful early adulthood is that eventually our survival dance and our sacred dance become the same dance, which is to say that our community supports us to embody our sacred dance because it serves life and our community in a very deep way. So whether we end up getting paid for it or, or people um, offer us uh, donations or they, they feed us or whatever, however it's done, our sacred dance becomes also our survival dance. Mm. Thanks. So um, I don't want to let you go without asking you about Animus Valley, about the, uh, you know, the organization that you co-founded and have led. Like what, what is it and what, what do you offer people? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, Animus Valley Institute has been around for 40 years, although we didn't incorporate till about 20 years ago. And uh, we have about 20 guides, soul initiation guides. These are people who've gone through an apprenticeship of five years or longer, usually with animus, but sometimes some um, people learn how to um, be soul initiation guides through other avenues. We have about 20 guides. Um, we offer, I don't know, 75, 100 or so experiential programs a year in something like 12 or 15 or 18 countries around the world. During 2020, that got curtailed a bit for obvious reasons, um, but we, we did shift to online programs and we still are doing online programs, but we also do in the field programs that, are, that meet outside. And we hope by the end of summer, most all of our programs will be in person again. Um, they're anywhere from five days long till 14 or, or so days long. Our vision fast are 14 days long. Um, or sometimes 12. Um, and our primary mission is supporting people who are in the cocoon and are, are ready for, are in the midst of the journey of soul initiation. But probably 25% of people who first come to our programs are actually ready for the descent to soul. Mm -hmm. And the others are usually early in the cocoon and some are still late in the oasis. So our um, more introductory programs are, which are there, there are many, are designed to support people to complete the um, enough of the task of the oasis so that they make it into the cocoon. Or it's also these programs are designed to help people do the early preparation work in the cocoon, which prepares them for a later descent. And our more advanced programs are, and we, we use um, application screening process to try to get um, people, make sure everybody in our more advanced programs are in the cocoon or later. Um, and those programs are designed to help people make this descent, this, this um, tumble into the depths of what we call Soul Canyon. Mm. Great, and um, the website for people who want more information? Yeah www.animus.org. Animus is the is um, the the Spanish word for souls. That would be pronounced by Spanish speaking people more like animas. Mm -hmm. um, but in and it's the name of the valley that um, Durango, Colorado, is in, which is where I make my home. So um, animus is spelled A N as in Nancy, I, M as in Mary, A, S as in Sam. So animus.org. And 
you'll be able to read a bunch of things about our work there and um, take a look at the various kinds of experiential immersions we offer. Great. And in addition to your four books, right? Four, yeah. Four books. Um, you, your organization puts out a newsletter, and I think, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, Janine Marie Hagen, is that right? Haugen. Janine Marie Haugen. She's my life partner as well as guiding partner. I'm actually um, at her home right now in southern Utah. And um, for the past year, she's been the primary one person at Animus writing what we call the weekly musings. Uh, we have, um, sometimes I write them as well and other guides do as well. But recently it's been Janine's and hers have been so popular. Um, nobody's asking for me to start writing them again, but I will eventually. <laughs> I, I will say I'm, just, I'm really loving um, her reflections. And, yes. and when I started reading them, I have to say like I would skip ahead to the good parts, like there'd be some nature thing. And then I'd be like, yeah. oh, what's the point? And now I'm finding myself really luxuriating on, you know, going outside in the cold or seeing the birds or hearing frogs or, you know, the, the thing that she's talking about, I'm starting to understand is not just sort of storytelling set up for the point, but actually contains the point. And I'm, um, so if you could if you'd let her know, I'm finding her writing. I will let her know. Just yeah, she's an extraordinary writer and she knows how to change consciousness of, of her readers, which is something that all really good writers can do. And so she's actually casting a spell in, in, by her writing. So I hope all our listeners today will take a look. Right, so they go to animas.org and then somewhere at the top, you can sign up for that newsletter. Absolutely, once a week, yes. Great. Well, Bill, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for the work you've done. I'm, I'm sure you've moved me several notches, even though I'm, st I'm still, uh, I don't know if I'm in the cocoon or, or close, um, but I, cer I certainly feel like there's, there's so much optimism in me knowing that there is a thing out there, that it's, mm. we're not just, you know, we're not just the creatures that the evolutionary psychologists tell us we are. We're just doing fancier ways of trying to, to mate and amass resources. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, your latest book, The Journey of Soul Initiation. Um, the previous one, Wild Mind, I'm, I'm still working through all the sub-personalities there. I discovered new... <laughs> new, yep. uh, you know, parts of the basement all the time. Yep. We're never done with them. They're never done with us. We just have a better relationship with them. Right. So thank you for everything you You're do welcome. and, have done, and uh, hope, I hope to meet you someday on some, uh, some wild trip. I hope so too. Thank you, Howie, for the invitation. And I've very much enjoyed our conversation and your great questions. Thank you so much. All right. Well, take care. Thanks again. Okay.